can be seated. If you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, we have extra Bibles. We'd be glad to let you use one. Hold up your hand and the ushers will get one to you. Maybe you've got three or four Bibles at home, but you didn't bring one today. Hold up your hand. Use one of ours. Turn in the scriptures to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4. If you don't know where that is, look, look at, uh, on either side of you. There's probably a person there that uh, knows the Bible real well and they'll help you find it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Anybody know what we've been talking about the last several weeks? You want some more of it? We've been talking about how, how to keep the love command. Most Christians know that the New Testament commandment from the head of the church, Jesus, is that we love one another as he has loved us. Most Christians know that. Most Christians know that it's important. They've heard it. They know you're supposed to do it. And yet, many have not thought much about it beyond that. And you got millions that feel kind of condemned or a lot condemned because they know they're not doing it. And they agree that it's important. But you know, you should only talk about something and its importance so long, and then you, if you're serious about it, you ought to say, okay, show me how. I'm ready. Let's do it. I agree. It should be done. Let's, let's do it. What's the next question? How do I do it? Show me how to do it. And you know, so much uh, you learn, not just by instruction, but by doing. Hmm? You only learn so much by instruction. And you get to the place where you, you stagnate unless you begin to put some of what you've heard into practice. How many remember when you first learned how to drive a car? Hmm? Well, you know, in the rural areas, you learn how to drive before you read the book. <laughs> right? In the city, they have classes. They teach you, you read the book, and you get driver's ed. In the country, daddy says, boy, jump in that truck and go get that hay. You ride the tractor with grandpa. Right? And you drive around in the yard and in the hay field and then to town. Hope you don't get caught. Am I just talking to anybody else? <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> but how many know you can read the book and read the book and read the book, and until you get behind the wheel, there's a lot of things just don't come clear to you. You read the book, but, the, the, you know, a lot of times they didn't even tell you that you couldn't see right over the bumper, and sometimes you couldn't see that line. When you're close enough to it, you can't. And judging distances and parallel parking, you can read four chapters on it. <laughs> but until you pull up beside that other car and start trying to make that thing fit in that spot, that space, a whole lot of, you get a lot of revelation, don't you? While you're pulling up and pulling back, moving and, you know, and you do it enough then what was just a mental concept on a page can actually become reality to you first, and then it can become second nature to you, can it? It can get to the place where you don't even think about it. I know uh, I, I'm a pilot. We fly, and we go to school uh, a couple of times a year. Uh, and when you get a new type rating on a jet... You go to ground school, and in the beginning, they don't even let you fly the plane. They, they got you in school, I mean, all day long. And, oh, brother, the numbers. I mean, this PSI, this PSI, and this speed, and that speed, and on and on and on. And, boy, the books are this thick, you know. 
And you can study and study and you can pass the test. Or you can ace the test. But then when you get in the plane, which in this case is the simulator, and that engine actually catches on fire, and you can't pull the book out. Where's that book? Where's that? It's not time, and then, you know, the instructor's not there to explain it all to you. I mean, you get revelation. And a time or two after that, then you want to come back and you want to read that again. And this time it's got more meaning to you now. Oh, that's why they said do that. That's why they said move that switch first. Well, this is it. Walking in love is not just an ideal. It's something to do. And yes, we come in church, and yes, we get our, 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 our head in this book, and, and, and we want instruction, but unless we put it into practice, unless we do it, we're not going to learn that much about it. You only learn so much by instruction, and the rest you'll learn as you do it. Somebody say, I learn as I do it. You know, so, so much of what we, Phyllis and I, have learned about faith. We learn by doing, putting the word into practice. You know, you, you heard it taught, but then as you walked it out, as you did it yourself, oh, you learned so much more. Somebody said out loud, I'm a doer. I'm a doer. Not just a hearer only. I'm a doer. I'm a doer. I'm a doer of the word of God. And you'll find as you are a doer, oh, the revelation flows. You don't just get taught while you're sitting in the seat. As you're putting it into practice, you learn so much. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, are you there? 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 9. As touching brotherly love. Now, I think sometimes this term just goes kind of right past us, brotherly love. Just think we just think it sounds nice. No, he's talking about a specific kind of love. This is the keeping of the love command. Anybody remember in the Old Testament, he talked about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and loving your neighbor how? Well, that'd be uh, what kind of love? <laughs> he didn't mention brother. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Jesus said it differently, though, didn't he? What did he say? That you love who? Now, God so loved the world, the world, that he gave Jesus. And we are to love people. But the commandment is not just to love the world. The new commandment is to love who? One another. Isn't that what he said? And who's he looking at? Who's he talking to when he said that? His disciples and us. We're his disciples. Love one another. Well, we're brothers. We're brothers. We're family. So that's, when you see in the New Testament, the epistles, brotherly love, you know he's specifically talking about keeping that commandment. Can you see that? So he said, concerning brotherly love, you need not that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Another translation said, the New Living says, God himself has taught you to love one another. The message says, you're God taught in these matters. You're already good at it. Your friends all over the province of Macedonia are the evidence. Keep it up. Get better and better at it. And that's the sense I had when the Lord gave us instruction concerning this uh, uh, teaching, this series, that you're already uh, practicing this. A lot of you are practicing this in a measure. But can we grow in it? Oh, oh, this is it. God is love. And the New Testament commandment is the commandment to love one another. And we are God taught in these matters. And we're focusing our faith on it in these weeks and months. How many are believing with me that God is teaching us, teaching this church, teaching this family, teaching you and I as individuals 
how to keep this love command. Say it out loud. Everybody confess it. I am, I am taught, of taught of God how to love. How to love. God, himself God himself is teaching me, is teaching, me. Is teaching us teaching how, how to love one another. Love how how to, keep the command. to keep the command. Glory to God. Is this exciting? Yes. You know, a lot of folk don't, don't think they're as excited about this as maybe something else. Well, look, Brother Keith, teach us how to prosper. I am. Yes. This is it right here. Yes. Well, Brother Keith, I need to be healed. Need to be, we're teaching on it right now. Yes. <laughs> Who heals? God heals. God is love. Yes. Love heals. Who prospers? God. God is love. Yes. Well, I need to know about my faith, how to get my blessing. All faith works by love. Everything you do, you need to keep one hand on this. That's why you get off. So are you at least a little bit excited? Or maybe even more than that? That God himself is teaching you, teaching me how to keep this commandment. And you know, he said... In fact, in John 13, why don't you just turn over there real quickly. Let's remind ourselves of the command. John 13, there is a very wonderful thing that goes with this that I think so many times people have not associated. They've not kept it together. John 13, 34. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you. Now, had they already been told to love people, to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love their neighbor as their self. Well, why is this new then? What's, what's new about it? A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, and here's the new part. How? As I, love you. As I have loved you. He loved us to the point of laying down his life. For us giving himself. He didn't just love us as himself. He sacrificed himself. He loved us better than himself. Oh, can you see this? Well, why didn't he tell them if that was the highest and the best? Why didn't he tell them that in the past, in the Old Testament? Because they couldn't. They couldn't love like that. Why? Because they couldn't be born again. Until Jesus had come and paid the price. But now Romans 5 tells us the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And we can love like Jesus has loved us. It's not based on feelings at all. He loved us while we were yet his enemies. It's not based on what somebody does to you or didn't do for you. It's not based on how you feel about them, how they made you feel. It's not based on feelings at all. You do it by faith. And you do it by the divine love that God has put inside you. Say it out loud, I can love love with the love he's put in me. me. No matter how I feel. No matter what has happened. happened. I can love love as he has loved me. You've got that love, not shed abroad in your feelings, not shed abroad in your head, shed abroad in your heart, in your insides. It's a decision to love. It's an act of faith to love. Can you love somebody when you feel like slapping them? Can you? Can you love somebody when you feel like hurting them? You can. It's a decision. Love is not a feeling. God is love. Keeping the commandment, obeying the order is not based on how you feel. There's there's such confusion. I know you've heard me say it, but I must keep saying it because most of the world thinks love is a feeling. And it is not. I said it is not. God is love. Love is an order. Love is a command. It's not a feeling. It's not based on feelings. You can, you're walking in love the strongest when you have the worst feelings. Everybody said out loud three times, 
Love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Say it again. Love is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. He didn't command us to feel for one another. We could camp on this the rest of the time. Why? Most of the church thinks love is a feeling. Love is not a feeling. He didn't say a new commandment I give to you, that you have feelings one for another, even as I've had feelings for you. (laughs) I want you to say it three more times. Love is not a feeling. Close your eyes. Say it out loud. Love is not a feeling. One more time. Love is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. I've had people look at me and say, well, I, I can't do that. I just, I, I don't love them anymore. What do you mean you don't love them anymore? What do you mean? What are they talking about? Can you tell me? They're talking about feelings. So they can't keep the command because they don't have the feelings. That's a lie. It's deception. They never knew what love was. You've been ordered to love. You can do it no matter how you feel. And the good thing about it, you keep the command like you're supposed to long enough, it'll affect your feelings. Feel it. Haven't you found out by now? Feelings are fickle. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. I mean, you felt yes, you felt different, different uh, ten minutes ago than you do right now. You'll feel different in another fifteen minutes. Feelings are constantly changing. They're up. They're down. They're in. They're out. They're good. They're bad. And if you live by how you feel, you're going to be a basket case. Right? I just don't feel like it. Well, I, I don't feel like going to work. I don't feel like preaching today. I just, I don't feel like, I don't feel like making the bed. I don't feel like, I don't feel like. I, don't, I know I told them I'd go over there and help them, but I just don't feel like it. You're going to ruin your life with that. I said you'll ruin your life and not even God himself can help you. Why? He won't make you do it. You have to, how many understand, you got to be able and be willing to, like the Bible said, endure hardness as a good soldier. How many soldiers you think? We got, we got men and women in the field right now defending us protecting us. You think they felt like going over there? You think they feel like driving through the streets with people pointing weapons at them? Huh? Comes time for them to go on their mission? You think they feel like leaving the tent? And, and, and who knows how many explosive devices are on the road between here and there? You think they feel like doing that? No, they don't. But a good soldier obeys orders. Gets the job done. Well, friend, you are a soldier in the army of the Lord. And the the head of this army has given you an order, given me an order. We've been ordered to love, and it is not based on how you feel. He didn't even ask you how you felt about it. And you don't need to ask yourself how you feel about it. Just obey Obey. the order. order. Anybody with me now? I got all kind of notes over here. But this is such a biggie. Say it one more time. Love is not a feeling. feeling. It's not a feeling. God is love. Love is a command. Love is an order. It's not based on how you feel. You can love somebody no matter how you feel and, and how they feel about you or how you feel about them. You can still keep the command. Can't you? You can feel like not wanting to be around them. Hmm? You can feel like never wanting to see them again. You can feel like, you know, I mean, when they open their mouth and talk, it's like somebody uh, scraping their fingernails on a chalkboard to you. (laughs) Seeing them hurts your eyes. (laughs) You 
can have feelings that bad and still. You can put on your uniform, you can put on your armor, you can get in your Jeep and go do your job. You know what I'm talking about? You can put on the armor of the Lord and you can obey the order of love. You can love them anyway. You can override your feelings. Say it out loud, I am not feeling dominated. I don't live by my feelings. I'm not ruled by my feelings. See, spiritual people are not ruled by their feelings. Carnal people are. That's their whole life. They base everything on how they feel. They do it or don't do it. They start it or quit it based totally on how they feel about it at the moment. And that's why they are failures in life. You'll be a failure in your marriage. You'll be a failure as a parent or a spouse. You'll be a failure as an employee if you live by your feelings. Because you'll be a quitter. Everything you do, you'll quit. Because, I mean, how many understand, how many that have made it uh, through anything for any length of time, there was a time you didn't feel like doing it? Huh? How many that have had success, some success in your job or your business, there were days you did not feel like going in or that you did not feel like finishing it or you did not feel like meeting with those people or you didn't feel like completing that job? How many? How many? Well, what if you just said, I don't feel like it, so I'm not going to do it. You, you could not have had success, right? And what you do is you cut yourself off from the blessing of the Lord. Love is not a feeling. Go with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. Well, ho hold up, hold up, I didn't finish here. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. If you skip over to the 15th chapter, he's still talking about this. Chapter 15, verse 10 if you keep my commandments, you abide, you'll live in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments, and abide, live, stay in His love. These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This will help us keep it straight concerning the real love of God. If you think, well, I, okay, all right, I'm going to do it. I'll lay my life down. I, you know, I'll be depressed about it, but I'll do it. No, no, doesn't work that way. If you really, the Bible said, Paul talked about it. He said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Even though the more I love you, the less you love me. Not just I'll do it, but did you hear those two words? I will gladly, I will very gladly do it. If you don't do it willingly, it's unacceptable. And when you keep this command, it's not going to make you miserable. What did it say? His joy when you're keeping the command. The, the joy that Jesus walked in when he was on the earth. The joy that was in his soul and in his heart and life. His joy is going to be in you, and your joy is going to be full. The selfish life is the miserable life. The feeling-dominated life, selfish life, is the miserable, unhappy, unsatisfied life. The giving life is the fulfilling life. Anybody believe that? Oh, it's a fact. Oh, it's a fact. Said out loud, the giving life, the giving life is, the is the fulfilling life. You see people that are unhappy, people that are miserable, people that are unfulfilled, unsatisfied, you know right away. All they do is think about their self, what they want, what they need, what they don't have, what somebody didn't do for them. They live to satisfy their self, and that's most of the world. 
But that's why most of the world's unhappy. You can be happy every day. You can be full of joy. You can be so full of joy. People wonder, how could it be like that? How could it be real? How could they really be like that? People say, what are you taking? What do you take? I'm not, I'm not taking anything. I keep the command. And it keeps me full of joy. But see, has the church equated that? No, the church has equated walking in love with being unhappy. Walking in love with sacrificing and not getting what I want. And I'll, I'll be a good Christian. But you won't be happy. You won't be having fun. Because you've got to walk in love <laughs> with everybody. <laughs> I can't lose my temper and I can't, you know... Do what I want to do. I got to let them do what they want to do. I mean, that's going to that's gonna not be any fun. No, according to the Bible, it's the most fun. It is the path to fullness of joy. This hadn't been preached properly. It hadn't been seen. In connection with keeping the command, people have only thought sacrifice and unhappy. Let's believe the Bible. What happens if you really just quit holding back and just keep the commandment completely? <laughs> what happens? You just forget about yourself, what you want, what you need, what you think. You just forget about it and just love people and just give, 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 give. What's going to happen? Well, for one thing, you're sowing. You're, what do you think is going to happen when you sow? It's going to come back to you. Right? And you're keeping the command. So your heart's clear and there's no condemnation. You're walking in love so your faith works. Everything you pray happens. Everything you say comes to pass. And your joy is full. You're living the life as God intended. Glory to God. Well, go to 1 Corinthians 13. I wanted to exhort you a little bit more about it, but should you be interested right now in how to do it more? Okay, okay, Brother Keith. Okay, okay. Show me how. Well, not just Brother Keith. The Lord is showing you and me how to do this. 1 Corinthians 13. Can you remind me of what we've already learned in this series? How to keep the love command, somebody help me out. How love prefers. What else? Love does no harm. What else? Love covers. Now these are all things we don't just read about in here, but when uh, uh, service is over, we go out and, and, and do it. Because you're going to learn the rest of it by doing it. Love covers. What else does love do? takes care of. What else does love do? Huh? Love edifies. What else? Love lays down its life. And will that make you miserable? No, it'll make you joyful. Make you joyful. And here's the next one. In 1 Corinthians 13, The great love chapter, the first part of it here, the description of how love acts and talks and thinks. 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, why would he say that? Why would God say that through him? 
Isn't it good to feed the poor? Hmm? Isn't it good to be able to prophesy, have revelations, have knowledge? Isn't it good to have faith, even big, strong, mountain-moving faith? Isn't that good? Isn't it good to be willing to sacrifice, even lay yourself down, give your body to, to save somebody? Then why does he say, you can, if you do all that and don't have love, it, it profits you nothing? Could you do it without love? Hmm? Could you prophesy without love? Have knowledge without love? Have faith to try to have it without love? Could you give to the poor without love? Oh, it's a lot of people give to the poor just simply because it's a write-off. Helps them tax-wise. There's a lot of people do things for the poor simply because it's good public relations. There's a lot of people do things for people because they want to get in the news. They want to get in the paper. They want to improve their image. And, and is that love? No, it's still about me. So why, I mean, give in your body to be burned. Could you do that without love? Apparently. Yeah. Well, then why would you be doing it? People do some things to prove how great of a Christian they are. Which still has nothing to do with loving the person you're doing it for. It's you on this quest to prove how selfless and how, uh, how much of a person of, of Christ you are. And people get in their own minds. They're living in this world by their self. Of what a great Christian I am. And how self, self-sacrificial I am. And I'm going to lay down my life for the Lord. <laughs> They'll talk about me when I'm gone. They'll say, what a saint. What a saint. No, nah, you were an ain't. Because you weren't doing it because you loved the people that were benefiting from it. You were doing it for some selfish reason. For pride. Can you see this? So there are people that do things and it looks good on the outside and maybe it in and of itself may be a good thing. But the Lord sees the heart. And he know and it comes back to, to motives of the heart. He knows why you're doing it. Right? Or why you didn't do it. He sees the heart. And it is unacceptable and there's no reward in it. It is vanity unless it is done in and of and from and to real Love, the real God kind of love that is not a feeling. And he begins to describe this God kind of love. He says, are you there in verse 4? He said, charity, which is it's the word for love, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not, love vaunts not itself, is not Puffed up. Now, let's, uh, this, all of this is rich, you know that, but we're focusing on one area today. Notice this love vaunts not itself. Verse 5 does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own. Love seeks not its own. Selfishness seeks its own. Love does not. And this is our point today. How to, how to, to keep this command? Love, real love, seeks another's good. Not just your own. Now let's, let's read some scriptures. You have time? Can you turn to a few scriptures with me? Let's read some scriptures. Go to... Uh, <clears throat> 
Let's see. You're in 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Just back up a couple of pages while you're so close by. Said out loud, love, love. seeks not its own. Well, if you're not seeking your own, what would you be seeking? Love does seek, but it seeks another's good. And every one of those words are significant. Love does what? Seeks. Somebody say seeks. Seeks. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and the 24th verse, 10, 24. What does it say? Let no man, so this is not just for preachers, right? It's for everybody. Let no man seek his own, but every man, what? Another's. And, and wealth is added by the translators, so uh, he, another's what? Well, another's whatever you'd be seeking for yourself. Instead of seeking your own, whatever you'd be seeking for yourself. What do most people seek for themselves? Their own betterment. Their own needs met. Their own relief. Right? Their own satisfaction and fulfillment. Their own desires. Well, what does love do? Instead of seeking mine, love would seek yours. And that's the key to me having full joy. Sounds backwards to the carnal mind. Well, no, no. Me having full joy is me seeking what I want and getting what I want. Because that, that makes me happy. No. No. You can't be. You can get all the money. You can get all the stuff. You can do all the things. And when it's all done and the dust is cleared, you're going to be empty inside. Hmm? It's a fact. There's not enough money to satisfy you spiritually. Not enough money on the planet. Not enough stuff. Not enough hobbies. Not enough physical activity. Nothing. Food cannot satisfy your spirit. Sex cannot satisfy your spirit. Things cannot satisfy your spirit. Drugs, alcohol cannot satisfy your spirit. You're made in the likeness and image of God. Deep calls unto deep. Your heart cries out whether you acknowledge it or not. Even atheists so-called, agnostics so-called, if they'd be honest, there's something in them crying out for their creator. Hmm? Yes, sir. Oh yeah, it's there. And people try to fill that void with every kind of thing and every kind of sin, and it cannot be. Right. Cannot be. What's going to fill you? The one who made you. And he is love. So can you see the new commandment is the key to your full joy. Why? Because in acting and obeying the love, you're sowing the love, you're going to be receiving the love, and that's the only thing that can make you happy. Yes. Yes. Sex is not love. In fact, making love is a misnomer. It is an incorrect term. God is love. Hmm? Between husband and wife, love can be expressed through sex. But sex is not love. Why do you say that? Millions are getting hurt. Aren't they? Looking for love and settling for sex. And being miserable, being unhappy. God is love. How are you going to be happy? Not seeking, trying to satisfy your flesh. It can never make you happy. Get to God. Sell out completely to God, as they say. Obey God completely. 
and do what he, I mean, so, so I'm giving my life to the Lord. He's the, my head. He's the captain of my salvation. Okay, your head told you then. He commanded you to love. Right? So get to it. And then what's going to happen with you? You will finally find the satisfaction that you've been hungry for. I'm taking all the drugs I want to take. I am snorting all the coke I want to snort. I am drinking all the whiskey I want to drink. I'm having all the affairs I want to have, which is none. Mrs. says, why? I don't need it. I don't need any of it. I don't need it. I'm having fun. I got joy. I got peace. It's available to every believer, isn't it? You want to increase your joy in the Lord? Increase your love walk. Comes right back to you. Can you say amen? Amen. Where are you? What did it say? 1024? Let no man do what? What does love do? Love seeks not its own, but what did he go on to say? But every man, in other words, seek every man another person's wealth or, or benefit. Go to the uh, 33rd chapter, I mean 33rd verse of the same chapter, 33rd verse. Verse 33, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, even as I please all men in all things, what does it say? Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Seeking not my own, but another's benefit. Selfishness seeks its own. And that's what most of the world is doing. Seeking my own advancement. Seeking my promotion. Seeking my satisfaction. Seeking my fulfillment. And when they open their eyes in the morning till they lay their head on the pillow at night, that's what they're doing. Seeking my advancement, my uh, prosperity, my increase, my fame, my success. Love will seek another person's success. Now, can you tell how it gets quiet? Because for years, Christians have talked about these things and, and without being willing or intending to do them. They talk about them and nod their head and go, Amen. That's right. Yep. And have no intention of doing it. Why? Because people want to seek their own. The flesh wants to seek its own. But is that the way to real success? Can you get fulfilled seeking your own? No, you'll be miserable. No matter how much you get, no matter how much you accomplish, some of the most miserable people on the planet are some of the most famous. You see people in the news all the time. They got more money than they could spend in five lifetimes. They got fame and they're miserable. They're looking for comfort in the bottom of a bottle or with a pill or through having 40 partners in the week. You understand what I'm talking about? And they're miserable. Why? Some people can live under the delusion that if I had the money, I'd be happy. They don't have it so they can believe the lie that if I could have it, I could be happy. Or if I was successful, they got it. And they found out I'm still not happy. That's why a lot of people commit suicide. You don't have to do it, though. You can be full of joy. I don't care if you're, like Brother Hagin used to say, if you're sitting on the creek bank with nothing, drinking branch water and eating wild onions and cold cornbread. 
you can still be full of joy. Right? You can still be full of joy because your joy is not based on that. It's based on the love of God that cannot fail, that nothing can separate you from. Go to Philippians 2 real quickly. Can you see as we go through these things that we've known far less about this than we thought we did? Just because you heard about it doesn't mean that you've you, that developed in it or that you've done it very much. But God is teaching us personally how to do this. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 and verse 4. Now we've seen witness after witness. I just want to establish it real strong here. Philippians 2, 4, what does it say? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Love does not seek its own. He says, well, how am I going to get it if I don't seek it? It's sowing and reaping. Hmm? Help somebody else's dream come to pass. What will God do? He will raise up somebody and send them to you. Hmm? You love them. God will love you directly and through other people. He'll put, God supernaturally puts people on other people's hearts. Doesn't he? He can drop you on people's hearts and they don't know why, but they just like you. And they just want to help you. It's called the favor of God. It's supernatural. So that's what I want. I want people wanting to help me. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> but it won't come about by you trying to talk them into it. Or by you seeking your own. How's it going to happen? By you genuinely and sincerely wanting to do it for somebody else. And doing it. Seeking their own. Seeking theirs, I should say. And not just your own. Love seeks not its own. Love seeks another's help. Go to 2 Timothy real quickly, please. 2 Timothy. And the first chapter. Now, this word seek is important. We're going to talk about it in just a moment, but here's a, here's a further confirmation of this. 2 Timothy, the first chapter, and down about verse 16. 2 Timothy 1, well, let's see, read uh, 15. 2 Timothy 1, 15. He said, the Spirit of God, through Paul, writing to Timothy and to us, he said, This you know, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. How many? Uh, you know, we shouldn't be just shocked to the point of falling off our chair and giving up if somebody quits us. If somebody, uh, pa I hear pastors all the time talking about it, people in ministry, their partners a long time left them or, or people, uh, partners in the church or supporters in the ministry left them. Did you know Paul had the same issues? <coughs> Did you know Jesus had the same issues? You remember Jesus when he preached that message on you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood? Whew. He lost multitudes of supporters. Didn't he? Multitudes. I guess thousands left him and walked no more with him over that one message. Now that's ignorant. But it happened. And if it happened with Jesus, it could happen with you. Paul. People left him. Right? He talked about, he said, Demas has forsaken us. Why? He loved this present world. He loved the nightlife and he wanted to boogie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Y'all needed to laugh. It was getting a little too tense in here. <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> I grew up in the 70s. What can I say? Uh, you might say, well, no, nah, you know, if, uh, I, I might leave you, but if I was with Paul, I wouldn't have left him. They did. Well, if I'd have been with Jesus on his team, I wouldn't have left him. Thousands did. Right? Why? Well, he said, all that are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. These apparently were two leaders. The Lord give mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me. And was not ashamed of my chain. You know, particularly when somebody is down or public opinion turns against them, a lot of other folks jump off the wagon too. Because they, they don't want to be associated with a sinking ship. Huh? And see, Paul had been thrown in prison. And he'd been there for a while. And things wasn't looking so good for him. And there were some other people that had some new doctrines that was gathering steam. Hmm? And people were jumping ship on Paul in mass. But he said, Onesiphorus and his bunch weren't ashamed of me. You know, I didn't smell good in that jail cell because they wouldn't let me bathe. And I'm in there and it stinks and it's dark and I got chains on and I'm, I look just like a, a thief or a murderer. They, they treat me like one. They dress me like one. But Onesiphorus and his bunch were not ashamed of me. Now keep reading. Oh, this is a good example here. Keep reading. What happened? When he was in Rome... Oh, this is love. This is love. This is love. Paul was not popular in some circles at this time. But on Onesiphorus, he did what? Come on, tell me. Read it out loud. He sought me out very diligently and what? And found me. Glory to God. Just minister to you. Keep reading. The Lord grant him that he may find mercy in the, of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered to me at Ephesus, you know very well. Very well. Did this man and his family love Paul? Did they love God? How did they do it? Love seeks not its own, but love seeks another's benefit and welfare and this word seek is important now hold your place here and go to Proverbs real quickly Proverbs 29 hold your place in 2nd Timothy go to Proverbs does this stir you up any today does this help you out love the love of God is so Great. It is so wonderful. Everything that God is is wrapped up in it. The honor of God, the glory of God is in the love of God. The deepest things of God are in the love of God. The highest and strongest things of God are in the love of God. Don't you know? Paul in that damp place with that lousy food and, and that can't get out and day after day and week after week and, and people in mass leaving you and Onesiphorus shows up with respect and some fresh biscuits and a change of clothes. Huh? And people met him, maybe Onesiphorus was well known, maybe he was respected individually himself, I don't know. But they met him at the jail cell and said, you want to see him? He said, yes, he's a man of God, he's my man of God. You not ashamed to go in there? No, I'm not ashamed. 
But all the others don't come see him anymore. They say he's off and God's not using him anymore. He said, well, they're wrong. They're confused. Let me in. Can I see him? Don't you know when Paul saw him? You ever been in a situation where you felt alone or you knew God was with you, but it just went on and on? I've been in a situation a few times when brothers and sisters walk through the door and it's hard to describe what it meant to you when they walk through the door and you can tell in their eyes why they're there, no reason, except they love you and they believe in you and they're there for you. Mm. It just, it, it can make the difference in your situation. You can be feeling weary and tired and about ready to quit and see them walk in and just get a recharge. Just go, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to do it now. I got reinforcements here. Yeah, I'm encouraged. Onesiphorus did that for Paul and his household did it for him too. And they did it over a period of time and they did it repeatedly. And he said, the Lord remember him. In that day, you know, things get to the point where, you know, you, you couldn't pay them back. You don't want to try, but you just say, the Lord remember it. And he will. And he does. Proverbs 29, are you there? Proverbs 29, 7. 29, 7. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked regards not to know it. What does that mean? The wicked what? The wicked don't want to know about it. Hmm? They don't want to hear about it, don't want to know about it. But a righteous man not only wants to know about it, will pursue it and find out about it. Can, can you go back to 2 Timothy now? Onesiphorus in this example, in, in this passage I should say, is a wonderful example of the love of God. God himself manifested his love to Paul through this brother. Didn't he? When he came in that jail cell, when he brought them hot biscuits and cheese. Yes. Glory to God. Huh? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and that fresh suit of clothes. Yes. It was like God himself came in that jail cell. Because it was. It was the love of God in this man. Manifesting to Paul and encouraging Paul. But notice what he had to do. Yes, yeah, some of you with me on this. What did he have to do? Read it again. 2 Timothy 1. Verse 17. What? When he was in Rome, what did he do? So he maybe he didn't know where he was. Right? Or how to get to him. But what did he do? See, it is too easy to go, well, I don't really know what's going on with them. And the wicked and the selfish don't want to know. Why? Because if I find out too much, I might feel like I need to do something and I can just play dumb. And Well, we just, and you hear about it later and go, well, we didn't know. We just, did, we heard something, but we didn't really know what was going on, and, and we didn't want to get involved. Why? Well, because you want to spend all your time seeking your own. But love. Now, now you, you can't do this for everybody on the planet. You're one person. You, you got limited amount of time, limited amount of resources. But God will put people in situations on your heart. Come on, can you all help me with this now? God will put people and situations on your heart. And, and let's be open and aware. There are reasons why we heard things and why we found out about them. Right? There's a whole world of stuff every day we didn't hear about. 
and didn't know about it, not, not going to know about it. Why? Well, it's, it's, it's really not something God could use us in. But there are things that you'll hear about, and when you do, you'll have a witness in yourself. Right. Something will stir up in you, and you'll know, I need to seek this out. I need to find out more about this. And, it's, and sometimes it can take 40 phone calls and three tanks of gas and two airline tickets and five hotel rooms before you get it. Are y'all with me on this or not? I feel like I'm kind of pulling this train by myself. Huh? Are you with me on this? You can't do this for everybody. It's, it's physically impossible. You can't. But how many understand this happened with this man? Yes. Onesiphorus. This is his man of God. This is who taught him about the word of faith and who led him to the Lord and his people. And though thousands have left him, everybody, all in those particular areas, including those two leaders, have left Paul. Yet he said, I, I don't understand everything that's going on or why he's in jail or why he's been in there that long. But I know this, he's my man of God. God used him to get the word to me and I'm going to show God respect. I'm going to show him respect. Where is he? And he called five people and nobody knew where he was. Is it enough to say, well, I tried. That's the best we could do. I just couldn't find out anything. Seek. Yes, seek. And you shall find. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Ask. It'll be given you. Knock. How long you knock? Till it opens up. How long you seek? Till you find it. Oh, we, we, we need to make some changes in this area. I know. In, in endeavoring to train people. You see this so many times. You, you, you give people an assignment, you give them a job, and, and they call two places and they look online for 30 minutes and come back and say, well, we couldn't find it. <laughs> that, that's lack of faith. That's spiritual laziness. Huh? It's lack of diligence. When do you stop looking? When you find it. You may need to make 18 phone calls. Huh? You may need to drive over there and talk to them in person. You may need to fly over there and spend a day or two. You may need to check the records. You may talk to this one and they'll tell you this and you go to that one. What did he do? He sought him out. What does the scripture say? Help me. Help me. Put it up on the screen. What? He sought me out. What? Not just diligently. Very diligently until what? He found him. Maybe they were hiding him. I don't know. Maybe they were keeping this thing hush, hush. They, were try they had him separated. Didn't want anybody to know where he was. But Onesiphorus was not easily dissuaded. He asked some questions. He took people out to meals. He had friends ask friends. Huh? He called his senator and his congressman. He knew a friend who knew somebody. And the biggest thing is he wouldn't quit. Next thing you know, he's standing there in front of the jail cell with fresh biscuits and a new change of clothes, most of all with love and faith. And Paul said, how did you find me? The Lord helped us. I wouldn't quit till I found you. Oh, come on. Do you see this? None of this half-hearted, feeble attempts. And I tried, and we looked, and we made a call and couldn't find out anything. And Listen to this statement. I, I don't remember who said it, but I, I wrote it down because it it's stuck with me. This individual said, a true friend won't come in good times unless invited. But in bad times, we'll be there without being asked. A true friend won't come in good times unless invited. But in bad times, we'll be there without being asked. 
What does love do? Love seeks not its own, but love seeks and will seek diligently until it finds another's good and another's help. Can you say amen? amen. I know, you know, uh, some of these things that have happened that the projects that the Lord has given us, we, we had to find people. I remember one of them, I won't go into the detail, but one of the projects that the church was involved in, I was actually, I had an afternoon off, and I was going to go get in the boat. And I was on the dock, getting ready to get on the lake. And the Lord put this guy on my heart. Well, I'm, I'm untying the boat. I'm thinking about riding around the boat. And, and the Lord kept you know, putting this guy on my heart, this, this person on my heart. I hadn't talked to them in decades. I had not a clue where they were or what they were doing. And the Lord dealt with me. Find him. Find out what he needs. <laughs> well, thank God we got good staff. And, and they made phone calls. And, and they searched. And they don't always find it first. But you just have to stay with it. And finally found this individual and finally got a number where I could get a hold of him. And, and I called him and he was surprised that I was calling him and said, well, hey, Brother Keith, what's going on? I wanted to say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but as a result, the, the whole church got involved in a major project. Glory. This kind of thing has happened over and over again. Well, what was leading us? The Bible said desire spiritual gifts, but what did it say? Follow love and desire spiritual gifts. Well, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, revelation about these things happens as you follow love. Because when you follow in love, you're following the Holy Ghost. You're following God. He is love. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus came to seek and to save what was lost. Somebody said out loud, I am a love seeker. I will seek. I will find. I will show love where he shows me. I'll not give up. I'll not quit. I'll seek diligently until I find. I'll stay after it. Until we do it, we do it. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Praise God. Stand up on your feet. Glory to God. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Praise your holy name. Oh, thank you, Master. Let's lift up our hands. Let's praise the Lord for His great love that He has loved us with. This great love that's been shed abroad in our hearts and for teaching us how to walk in it. Lord, we thank You. Lord, we worship You. Lord, we magnify You. Lord, we glorify You. Praise You. Praise You. Praise You. Praise You. Come on, praise Him. Lord, we praise You. We praise You. We praise You. We praise You. Praise You for Your great love. Praise You. Thank You for Your great love wherewith You have loved us. Thank You. Thank You. Thank You. Thank You. Thank you, the love of God that seeks and saves. The love of God that seeks and finds. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for that love that's in us. Everybody say it out loud. Thank God. Thank you, Father, for your great love wherewith you have loved me. I have believed it. I have received it. This love that's in me, I will follow and I will seek that which you direct and show love when and where and the way 
that you show me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Ushers, would you come on down? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that Jesus came to seek and save you? He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I found you. I sought you. I chose you. Aren't you thankful he sought you out? And he found you. And he saved you. And he came to you. We're going to celebrate that sacrifice that he has made. And in doing so, we're going to celebrate the love that's in us now. As we partake of communion. You can be seated. Keep your eyes open until you're served and just pray or or sing with the guys. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. But the blood.
not been served, if you have not been served, raise your hand. We don't want to miss anybody. You might say, well, Brother Keith, I hadn't been living right, this and that. Well, that's why he paid the price. You can repent and receive and be cleansed. Don't be left out today. If you haven't received elements, raise your hand. We'll wait on you. Okay. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Hallelujah. Would you stand, everyone, please? Hold the elements in your hands. He said, I received of the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. There were those who forsook Jesus. There were those who betrayed him. But in covenant, covenant language and covenant bread and covenant wine, he exhibited his love to them. He laid aside his garments and washed their feet, demonstrating that he cared about the lowest, dirtiest part. Said out loud, Lord, Lord you, said, you said, you would never leave me. 
you would never forsake me. You would love me forever. You would always be with me. Nothing could separate me from your love. I believe it. I receive it. And I give my love to you. I will not forsake you. I will not leave you. I will not quit you. You sought me and found me. I will seek you. I will find those you direct me to find. I will show your love. I will reverence your body and love your body in Jesus' name. Break the bread. Eat. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Say it out loud again. I love love the body of Christ. Christ. After the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped and said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Hold up the cup. Said out loud, I've been washed by the blood. I've been bought and paid for. Thank you, Master, for loving me, seeking me, finding me, saving me. I reverence your blood. I have faith in your blood. It is love's blood that has saved me. Take and drink. Washed by the blood. Clean by the blood. No, you're not guilty and dirty and foul. If you have repented, you're forgiven and you're clean. No matter how you feel. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I want you to say it out loud. I have repented. repented. Now, if you hadn't done it, do it right now. Do it right now. Repent means admit it, acknowledge your sin, and, and purpose by God's grace to live differently. So say it again. I have repented. I have repented. And I receive my forgiveness. And I am clean. I am washed. He loves me and has made me clean with his own blood. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It doesn't matter what you've done or how many times you did it or how long you did it. His blood is more powerful than all. His love is greater than all. Glory to God. Glory to God. Say it again. I have repented. And I'm forgiven. And I'm cleansed. He loves me. And has made me clean. With his own blood. Hallelujah. Believe it. Believe it. Be sure of it. So there's no reason for you to hang your head. There's no reason for you to be ashamed. No reason for you to feel guilty. And don't believe the devil's lies that the Lord don't love you anymore. You know he does. You know he does. Praise be unto God. Well, I am enjoying meditating on the love of God. I'm learning myself. I'm growing. How about you? Well, uh, our guests will be coming into town. For our marriage meeting, we have a number of ministers coming in, and a number of uh, people coming from all over the country and other places. Uh, the 
people have already prayed. And Dave has led the guys on Wednesday night and, and prayed. And uh, how many are ready to join your faith and believe God? You know, you don't know what's going on in people's lives and at home. Uh, some people may be on the brink of quitting. Some people may have come, may be coming and going, Lord, you know, uh, if you don't help us during this week, that's it. We're going to quit. Now, they ought not think like that, but sometimes people have. How many believe God can work miracles? Yes. And people that just can't stand to live with each other, and uh, that are married, I'm talking about, that uh, they can get over it. <laughs> and they can, uh, what was bitter can become sweet. So everybody, let's join our faith with the prayers that have already been prayed. Everybody said out loud in prayer, Father God, Father God we, pray your hand we pray your hand on every husband, on every, husband, on every, wife, on every wife, on everyone, on everyone that, will that will be in these services. Minister to them right now. Prepare them for the Word and the move of the Spirit. Before they get here, they get on, the way, on the way, we bind up, we bind up what, would what would hinder them or try to stop them, stop. prevent them from coming, them from or, prevent them from or prevent them from receiving. While they're here, While they're here. we believe with them, believe with them. for revelation, revelation. Grace, grace, help, help. Miracles. miracles, get glory to yourself. In us, in, us. In, them. in them, in your marriages, in your homes, in your families, in your church, we believe we receive it in Jesus' holy name. Glory to God. Glory to God. So be it. So be it. We're going to sing and be dismissed as we go, if you confess Jesus for the first time today, why? I mean, you don't have to come down to the front to be saved. You, if you confessed and had faith in the blood while you were taking communion, maybe you were born again right now. Maybe you were born again watching over the Internet or TV. Call us, write us, email us. Let us uh, converse with you and, and encourage you. If you're in the room... Don't leave without telling somebody. You need to confess Jesus to somebody else. There'll be people standing along the front here. Come down and tell us if you received Jesus this morning or if you got back to him. Let us rejoice with you and encourage you and help you. Let's sing as we are dismissed. Living in love. Living in love.